What's up guys, welcome to Bardent, my name is Heinrich, and today we're going to take a look at creating a super simple dash ability that also has a ghosting or after image effect. Before we jump into Unity, let's take a look at how we're going to do this. When the dash button is pushed, we will check to see if we can dash, and if we can, we will set the character's velocity to something high and keep it there for the dash duration, or until an object gets in the way. The after image will be created by instantiating game objects on the character's position with the same sprite as the character. We will then decrease the alpha of the after image over time. To make sure this is done efficiently, we will use what is called object pooling. While object pooling might be a bit overkill for this use case, I feel like this is the perfect opportunity to explore what object pooling is and why it is useful. The issue of this comes when we instantiate and destroy game objects. Doing this takes up a lot of resources and can really slow down our game, especially if you're working on a game for a mobile device. When we destroy game objects, Unity needs to take care of clearing the memory again so garbage collection comes into play. To get around all of this, instead of creating and destroying game objects, we will just create a bunch at the start of the game and keep them disabled to the side in a pool until we need them. So now, as our character moves across the screen, when we want to place an after image game object, we just take one from the pool and place it where we need it. Then, when the time runs out and we need to get rid of it, instead of destroying it, we will just disable it and put it back in the pool. Thus, we only ever create the objects once and reuse them as we need. Okay, now let's actually jump into Unity. We'll start by creating the after image prefab. Create a new game object and call it after image. Reset its transform and then hit add component and add a sprite renderer. Now let's head into the script folder and create the script for the after image prefab. So right click and then click on create, C sharp script and let's just call it player after image sprite. Then click on the after image game object and drag on the script we just created. We can now open up the script. Go ahead and delete all the pre-generated code. We are going to need a reference to the player game object to be able to get its position and rotation. So let's start off by declaring a private transform and we'll call it player. Next we need a reference to the sprite renderer on this after image game object. So let's create a private sprite renderer and we'll just call it sr. We also need a reference to the player game object sprite renderer so that we can get the current sprite. So let's declare another private sprite renderer and let's just call it player sr. We want to decrease the alpha of the sprite over time, which means we need to make changes to the color setting. So let's create a private color and just call it color. We also want to say how long this game object should be active for, and we also want to keep track of how long it has been active. So let's declare a private float active time, and just set it to 0.1 by default. And then we'll declare a private float time activated. We also want to keep track of what the alpha currently is. So let's create a private float and call it alpha. And we also want to set the alpha to something when we enable the game object. So let's create a private float alpha set. We can just set this one to 0.8 by default. Next, we want to decrease the alpha over time. So I'm going to create a private float alpha multiplier and just set it to 0.85 by default. The smaller this number is, the faster the sprite will fade. If we want to be able to change active time and alpha set in the inspector, all we need to do is in square brackets, write serialize field above each variable. I didn't do this, but you can also write this above alpha multiplier if you want to mess with how quickly your sprite fades. Now we're done with the variables, let's look at the functions. We are going to take advantage of the onEnable function, which is just like the start or awake function, except it gets called every time we enable the game object. In here, we will start by getting a reference to the sprite render component of this game object. So we'll say sr equals get component of type sprite renderer. Next, we will get our reference to the player by saying player equals game object dot find object with tag, and the tag is player. And then we'll say dot transform to get the transform component. Make sure you're using the right find game object. Now just quickly jump back into the editor and go to the player game object and set the tag to player. Back in the code, we can get the reference to our player game object's sprite renderer by saying player sr equals player.getComponent of type sprite renderer. Next, we need to set our alpha equal to alpha set. Now let's get the correct sprite. We'll say sr.sprite equals player sr.sprite. We can then set the position of our game object to our player's position with transform.position equals player.position. We can then do the same for the rotation with transform.rotation equals player.rotation. And then finally, for our onEnable function, we can say timeActivated equals time.time. .time. Now we can work with our update function. We'll start off by decreasing the alpha with alpha times equals alpha multiplier. We can then create our new color with color equals new color 
using the parameters 1, 1, 1 and alpha. Next we can set this color to our sprite with sr.color equals color. And finally we just need to check if this after image has been activated for long enough. And so we can say if time.time .time is greater than or equal to time activated plus active time. When this is true, we can just add this object back to the pool. We'll come back to this line of code later when we've created the pool script. So for now we're done with this script. Let's jump back into the editor. In the scripts folder, let's create a new script and call it player after image pool. Before we look at the code, I just want to give a shout out to Jason Wyman. He created an awesome video talking about object pooling and this is the code I got from that video. You can use the card in the top right corner if you want to go watch that video now, I highly recommend you do. Anyways, open up the script and just delete the pre-generated code again. We can start off by writing private game object after image prefab. This will be used to store a reference to the prefab we'll be using for the after image. Go ahead and also make this a serialized field so that we can add the reference in the inspector. Next, we can create a private queue of type game object and we'll call it available objects and set it equal to a new queue of type game object. This will be used to store all the objects that we have made that are not currently active. Next, we'll create a super basic singleton that we can use to access this script from our other scripts. Then we'll look at our private void awake function. And inside the function, we will say instance equals this to set the reference. Now let's write the first function. We'll say private void and we'll call it grow pool. The purpose of this function is to create more game objects for the pool. In this function, we'll just create 10 game objects at a time. So we'll say for int i equals zero, i is less than 10, i plus plus. And inside the for loop, we can declare a var and call it instance to add. A var is a data type which basically tells the compiler to figure out what it should be when it compiles. So when we declare it and set it equal to a game object, the compiler will know that it should be a game object. So var instance to add equals instantiate after image prefab. Now just for organization we will say instance to add dot transform dot set parent transform. This will make the game object we create a child of the game object this script is attached to. Finally we will call another function we will write in a second called add to pool and we will pass this instance to that function. Next we'll say private void add to pool and this function will take in a game object and we'll just call it instance. In the function, we will say instance.setActive false. And then we will add the game object to the queue with available objects dot on queue instance. And actually this function is supposed to be public so that we can call it from our other scripts via the singleton. Our next function will be used to get an object from the pool. We will call this function from our other scripts instead of instantiate. So we can say public game object because this function will return a game object and we'll call it get from pool. Inside we'll say if available objects dot count equals zero grow pool. This means that if we're trying to get an after image object to spawn and there are none available, we'll make some more. Next we'll say var instance equals available objects dot dq. This will take an object from the queue. Next we'll say instance dot set active true. When this happens, the on enable function will get called in our player after image sprite script. Then finally, we will return the instance. We'll go back to the awake function and just call grow pool once so that some game objects are ready when it's needed. Now let's go back to the editor. Create a new folder and call it prefabs. Go into the folder and drag the after image game object we made earlier from the hierarchy to the folder. This turns that game object into a prefab. Now click on the prefab and in the inspector under additional settings, change the sorting layer to player and the order in layer to negative one. Now let's create a new empty game object and call it player after image pool and reset the transform. Add the player after image pool script to the object and then drag the after image prefab into the slot. Next we can set up our dash button. So click on edit, project settings and go to the input tab. Increase the size by one and go to the last button. Change the name to dash and set the positive button to left shift or whatever button you want to use for dash. And that's it. Before we head into our player controller script, Let's jump back into the player after image sprite script and finish the update function by typing in the if statement player after image pool dot instance dot add to pool game object. We write this instead of destroying the game object. Okay, now we can finally head into our player controller script and make the dash happen. We'll start off by declaring all the variables we're going to need. First, we'll create a private boolean and call it is dashing. This will keep track of if the character is currently dashing or not. Next, we'll say public float dash time 
This is how long the dash should take. Then we have a public float dash speed. This is how fast the character should move when it's dashing. Then we have a public float distance between images. This is how far apart the after image game object should be placed when dashing. Then our last public float is our dash cooldown. This is how long we have to wait before we can dash again. Now let's go to our private float section and declare a private float dash time left. This will keep track of how much longer the dash should be happening. Then we will say private float last image x position. This will keep track of the last x coordinate where we placed an after image. Then we have a private float last dash. This will keep track of the last time we started a dash and will be used to check for the cooldown. We'll just set it equal to negative 100 by default so that we can dash as soon as the game starts. We can now head into our check input function and at the bottom we'll check if the dash button is being pushed by saying if input.getButton down dash. Inside the if statement we'll call a function we'll write just now called attempt to dash. Now if we want to only be able to dash after a cooldown we'll only call this function if time.time .time is greater than or equal to last dash plus dash cooldown. Now we'll write the private void attempt to dash function. Inside the function, we'll start by setting is dashing equal to true. Then we will set dash time left equal to dash time. Then we can set last dash equal to time dot time. Now let's drop our first after image. To get the game object from the pool, we'll say player after image pool dot instance dot get from pool. Then we can save the x position of this image with last image x position equals transform dot position dot x. Now we'll create a private void function called check dash. This function will be responsible for setting the dash velocity and checking if we should be dashing or if we should stop. So we'll start off by saying if is dashing to check if we should currently be dashing or not. And then inside the if statement, we will set can move equal to false since we don't want to be able to control the character while we dash. Then we can set can flip equal to false as well so that we cannot flip the character mid dash. Next, we'll set the character's velocity to the dash velocity with rb.velocity equals new vector 2 with dash speed times facing direction for x and rb.velocity.y for the y. If you don't want the character falling while dashing, you can also set the y to 0. Next, we'll say dash time left minus equals time dot delta time. Now we need to check if enough distance has passed for us to place another after image. So we can say if mathf dot absolute value transform.position.x minus last image x position is greater than distance between images. Inside the if statement we'll say player after image pool dot instance dot get from pool and last image x position equals transform.position.x. Now actually all of this is supposed to be in another if statement and that is if dash time left is greater than zero. So just cut and paste it in there. After this if statement we have if dash time left is less than or equal to zero or is touching wall. This means that we should no longer be dashing if the time has run out or if we touch a wall. Then we can say can move equals true and can flip equals true. Now we just need to go and call check dash from our update function. And that's it. Now we can dash by pushing the left shift key just like this. I hope you found this tutorial helpful and learned something new. If you have any suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. I have also created a Discord server for the channel. I will try to be on it for a bit every day if you need help or if you just want to chat with me or other people in the community about game design. The link will be in the description and on my channel banner. Anyways, thanks for watching and have a lovely day.